Let's do this. So, we begin chapter one, right? And section one was importance of money. Enough. After 45 minutes or 50, you can have all of your things. Number one is why money is important. Importance is associated with in direct exchange. Okay, number two is origins are associated with or come from barter. That's before there is money. And with barter, you have three fundamental problems. And money meaning indirect exchange resolves three, these three fundamental problems associated with barter. Next we got three. Qualities of money. And here we had a whole bunch of things. Number one, if it's going to be money, it has to be recognizable. People should know that it's money. It has to be better. What else? It has to be durable. Yes, if it's not durable, it doesn't work. Tomatoes never work as money. Milk doesn't work as money. Wheat works as money. Rice works as money. So, a question good for the quiz is, which is better money? Wheat or rice? Based on the qualities that it has. It has to be relatively abundant. People got to have some of it. They don't have to have a lot. Some. Money is for exchange. You don't need a lot of it, okay? People say, oh, I want a lot of money. Wrong. Mostly wrong. People want a lot of wealth. People want to be rich, okay? And being rich and wealthy doesn't mean having a lot of money. It can mean you have a lot of land, thousands of acres of land. Means you have a lot of houses, five, 10, 20 houses, okay? Means you have five or 10 cars, lots of gold, lots of other things, jewels, okay? You don't have to have a lot of money to be rich and wealthy. And again, if you're rich and wealthy and you need money, you can always want borrow if you really need it, or two, sell a house or something else. So don't think that actually rich people have a lot of money. It's mostly not true. Now, rich people may have a lot of stocks. They may have a lot of bonds. They may have a lot of investments. It will come later on. We'll discuss probably next time, not today, that demand for money by rich people is very low. It's poor people that kind of like demand money. Okay, and then we're going to discuss something more, the difference between demand money and want to have money. There are differences between wanting things and economic demand. All right, so it's got to be a little bit uh, abundant. It has to be somewhat scarce. scarce. Now, let's notice that these two are contradictory, meaning it has to be relatively abundant and it has to be 
relatively scarce at the same time. It can't be too abundant, it can't be too scarce. One of the most important properties of money is divisible. Somehow, divisible means when you slice it in two pieces, the sum of each piece equals the total. And I explained that a house with a cow, it doesn't work. A cow alive is typically worth more than a cow cut in two or ten pieces. All right, and I have one or two more. Let's see what else. I already wrote durable, so I can add this durable or I can add extra. Some of these are almost the same. If it's scarce, it will mean relatively valuable. Durable and also is connected to store of the value. All right, let's see if I got anything else here. Yes, part of being highly valuable, I'll add it here, is portable, easy to carry with you. And portable, part of being portable is also partially durable. Uh, it's like an egg, it's not easy to carry around an egg, it breaks easy. So it's a little bit of a problem for the egg. Okay, that's why for portability, metals are usually the best to carry around. Again, part of being durable is also doesn't depreciate much. If you get to use it or carry it too much in your pocket, you don't get to, you know, depreciate a lot. Let's see what else I got. So, the explanation which I came up with is that Gold and silver serve or satisfy all of these seven or eight primary qualities best and they satisfy them better than anything else. So, it, when people say and talk that gold is best money, it's not because they love gold, because of a cult, because of a religion or for any other reason. Just the physical properties of gold, nice, beautiful, shiny, okay, very durable, does not paint, does not rust, does not change its color. It's relatively abundant, but it's relatively scarce. Gold is very easy to cut, slice, and work and do all of those things. It stores value, so when it comes to gold and silver, they are the best of the best. The third best historically has been copper. Copper has always served, but copper is very, very abundant, okay? And it has a very, very low value, so copper is like cheap. And therefore, copper doesn't serve as well, but it serves good for poor people and for small transactions, for little pieces of buying. Let's say to buy one egg, you may use one copper coin. Gold is too expensive. One gold could be worth a thousand eggs. It's more like 10,000 eggs will be one ounce of gold. 10,000 eggs is way too much. All right, let's see what else. Number four, we already said is the monetary. unit of money. So let's call it monetary unit. unit. And the monetary unit is simply a quantity of money. And the measurement of quantity is for at least gold and silver, and in general for money, will be the weight. The weight. Okay, so what is the weight? We also mentioned a simple thing called exchange rate. An exchange rate is simply the ratio with which two monies, two different monies exchange, maybe gold and silver or British pound and American dollar or dollar and yen. And the exchange rate of two monies, if they are the same metal like gold, will simply be the weight ratios. The weight of the one rate of the one money divided by the weight of another money. 
And monetary unit is just a, turns out to be a name. And it's the name for the weight. Like pound sterling. Is the weight is the pound and sterling is the quality of silver. Alright. I tried last time to explain and I'll try very simple again. You have the king who has a total of five coins. Now, you can think in terms of 500 coins or 5,000 coins or 5 million coins. And the king will take each coin and take half of the gold in it. We'll put next to the gold, we'll put for the one half, half gold, half copper. Copper is yellow and what, but it's not exactly the same. And they'll put more of the base metal, the cheap metal on the inside, and they'll put more of the shiny, precious metal on the outside. So they'll take one half and make a new coin, and they'll take the other half and make a new coin. So, it takes one coin, it makes out of it two. The new coin will have only one half, only one half. So if this is 10 grams, this will be five grams, and this will be five grams. Five grams, five grams, okay? They will look on the outside the same. On the outside, they will be nicer, more beautiful, more shiny. But don't look at how shiny they are. Look on the inside. And on the inside, there is less gold. Okay. So, what they did was basically create before you had five coins. Now you have ten coins. When the king takes all the coins up front, from everybody, let's say 5 million coins, he will re-coin and create 10 million. He will return 5 million to the people and 5 million coins he got for himself. That's for him a gain. That's for him a profit, okay? That's, he basically cheated the people out of their money, out of, in this case, Half of their money. Well, this process, and I wrote it back last time, is called debasement. Debasement means lowering the precious metal value or the precious metal weight in a coin. Debasement is profitable for the government. It's very profitable. If you debase by 10%, the government profits 10%. If you debase 50%, the government profits the 50%. So they pocket as much as they can get. So government has a vested interest to control money, that's number one, obviously, to control the weight and occasionally to debase whenever they need a little extra money. Debasement for the government is a source of revenue. Source of revenue. And it's a hidden source of revenue. It's not easy to see. Uh, well, eventually, when the government tries to cheat people, eventually, two months later or two years later, people catch on. They realize they got cheated by the new king or whoever the finance or the money just less. They realize this eventually. But for the government, it's an immediate source of revenue, is in kind of like profit. Okay, let's see what else we got. So, the basement is basically the government redefining the coin to have a lower weight. 
and extracting the difference for itself. Now, debasement means that those who make the money profit, those, those who coin the money profit, and of course, naturally, those who create the money profit. We already explained it last time. If I can print a billion dollars, I could profit from it. I can extract the profit. So the profit goes to those who create the money. This is the most important lesson to learn in money and banking. Of course, the second one coming a few weeks down the road is that commercial banks themselves create money and profit from it. That's coming later. All right, let's see what else. <coughs> Uh, well, what else is coming is very simple. Historically, every government, every kingdom, every empire has always grown to prosperity based on good, high quality, usually gold or silver, honest money. Historically, economic, social, cultural, political decline for any society anywhere in the world, not just the West, also Arab world, including Muslim culture, Christian world, including Christian culture, including China with their own culture and religion, Japan, any society that debases its money is usually a result or a consequence of its ongoing decline in culture, morals, politics, laws, in general, social decline, and of course, political decline, and of course, fiscal is in government decline. These two go hand in hand. These are all social processes, and money is the best way to see where the society is going. And the basement of money and money inflation is a good way to judge a society, the maturity of a government and the overall society. All right, let's see what else I have. Oh, okay. Next one is basic, and that's very actually important. Yes. Money supply. Money supply is simply the number of coins. But we can have twice the coins, twice the number of coins with half the weight. So eventually, money supply is simply the weight of the metal, the weight of the gold. How much metal is out there? Now, if you make twice as many coins with half the grams, let's say five grams instead of ten. Each new coin will be worth eventually only half of the original value. So the value of the old five coins, the total value will be exactly the same as the value of the new coins. Okay? You cannot change the value. You can change the quantity of each, you can change the number, but when you multiply the number of the coins by the quantity or the weight of gold, you all get the same number. So these were 5 coins times 10 grams was 50 grams, and these are 10 coins times 5 grams is 50 grams. What about prices, which is coming next? Prices. With prices, it's very straightforward. If you double the number of coins, prices will double in terms of the new coins. So, debasement is lowering the value. If you lower the value in half, prices will double to reflect the same old value. So, the new value of money will be reflected in prices. So prices adjust to reflect more value. 
Think of it very simple. What will happen if here, let's say, we simply double the amount of US dollars in the country today? Well, most likely, houses prices will double easily and quickly, car prices will double easily and quickly, and that's where I'm heading, probably today, but most likely next time. So, that's the money supply. All right, and that's chapter two. Chapter two is what I'm heading today. Okay, that's right here. Chapter two. What determines prices? Okay, what determines prices? So we say price. Determined. That answer is shockingly simple. This is one of the easiest answers you can have in economics. Prices are determined by supply and demand. All we need to do or try now is to apply supply and demand to money and to prices. Let's take a look and see. Alright, well first, basic economics. Demand in general is downward sloping. That's perfectly familiar. As you raise the price of something, the quantity demanded falls. As you lower the price of something, quantity increases. If you lower further the price, quantity demanded increases. That's basic, straightforward economics. Recall this thing here, demand curve. And is exactly the same as demand schedule. That's the name. A schedule will be basically a little table telling you what price, what quantity, what price, what quantity, what price, what quantity, price. So for each price, it tells you a respective quantity. That's the demand. So, high price, we can use now this thing here. If price goes up, this is P for price, this arrow means increasing, go up, means that the quantity goes down. Now here, this is not the quantity, it's the quantity of the demanded, or quantity of demand. Quantity demanded goes down. That's a basic relationship, nothing new here. Let's see what else we have. Alright, so that's fairly straightforward. There's absolutely nothing here. Now, same will be, and that's actually a lot more interesting and important, is supply. Supply is typically upwards sloping. So, you have quantity, you have price. At one price, you will have a particular supply. This is S now, and right S here. We should be writing D and D here. You increase a little bit the price, the quantity supply will increase. Okay. And as you increase the price, quantity supply 
increases. That's again very straight straightforward. So as price goes up, you have quantity supply also increases. Again, fairly straightforward. Next is suppose there is a surplus. Let's see which way we're gonna have as a surplus. Okay, suppose you have a demand curve, suppose you have a supply curve, okay, and suppose that the price is here. Okay, let's see. Do we have a surplus or shortage? Here goes like this. This here is supply. This here is demand. This here is quantity supply. This here is quantity demanded. Now, quantity demand is greater than quantity supply. Therefore, we have a shortage. Okay. So, how does the market adjust in shortage? How does the market adjust in shortage? What is the adjustment process? How does the market work? It's very simple. If there is a shortage, means people actually have money. People want to spend. People want to buy. If you increase the price, let's say, $5, if you increase, now this here is representing the shortage quantity. This is something people want to buy, but it's not available. Well, here is something interesting. Suppose the price from five goes to six. What is the logic? Sellers see, oh, people are coming, people want to buy, but it's not there. And instead of asking for five, they will ask for six. Why would they ask for six? Hmm? Well, no, if, if you're a seller, why would you sell at six instead of five? Quantity supply is limited. Uh, so, okay, let's try again. People want to buy. People come. People ask them for it. And you have only three pieces. Why, if you're a seller, you will raise the price from five to six? Hmm? There's a lot of demand. Okay, let's try to get something simpler. There is one fundamental reason. It's called profit. Profit. We call this profit motive. People raise, suppliers raise prices when there is a higher demand because they are driven by profit. If you raise the price, you will make more profit. If you lower the price, you will have less profit. So the profit motive drives suppliers to raise the price. So the profit motive is what adjusts the lower price when there is a shortage to a higher price. Now, at six, the condition is fairly clear. Again, there is, again, shortage. And those sellers that raise the price to seven will profit even more. So, the most important part to understand is that there are two elements that need to be satisfied. One is profit motive. And it's always there, guaranteed. People always want to make more money. People are, by nature, greedy. The more profit, the better. This is the one thing which is guaranteed by human nature. It's just the same for Chinese as with Japanese, with British, with French, with English, with Russian people. 
Hungarians, with Thai, with anybody in the world, they want more money. The second part is trickier. It's called free prices or free adjustment of prices. As long as prices can adjust freely, in other words, sellers can raise the price, everything is great. Okay? This thing works. Now, obviously, when you raise up to 8, we say that demand equals supply. We say that the market clears. Clears. To clear means that demand equals supply, means there is no shortage, it means there is no surplus. This clearing in economics is called equilibrium. Well, what if the price starts out at 15? Starts out at 15 here. What happens now? Oh, there will be this we call shortage. And this is surplus. So, you're a salesman, okay, or a merchant, you have a lot of stuff, your bed is selling 5 units and you have 20 units, and have 15 units of surplus. And you are greedy, you want to make more profit. Now you sell only 5 units and your profit is not big. What is the response if you want to have more profit? Yes. Well, number one, if you have extra or surplus and you're trying to sell eggs, your eggs will spoil. You will lose everything on, that egg, on those eggs. It's better to lower the price and sell the eggs and get something rather than nothing. That's the big difference to understand in a surplus situation. In a surplus situation, if you're a merchant, if you're a dealer, and I've seen this a lot, happens a lot in Asia, where small or even mid-sized businesses, they put a particular price, they cannot sell anything, they're not willing to lower the price, and they go bankrupt. That's what happens to businessmen who are not wise, who are not adjustable, who cannot change according to demand and supply. So, it is always more profitable to lower the price and the guarantee is price adjustment. The seller wants and lowers the price and the profit motive. Now, here's the next thing to understand, which is of course simple, common sense. You're all salesmen, okay? You're all selling whether it's eggs or iPhones, doesn't matter. If two, three, or five of you decide to lower the price from 15 to 14, you lowering the price of 14 will sell a lot more. You will make a lot more profit, and those selling at 15 will sell nothing. You're actually going to be losing money. So, not only when you lower the price to 14, you actually gain and profit more, but these guys actually lose more. They actually lose money. So, when these guys lower the price, it forces you to lower the price too. You can't have the situation where half the people lower the price and half the people keep the price up. Yeah, they can keep the price up, but they will not sell anything. And as a result, these guys will make more profit, they will grow their businesses, and those that keep the price high cannot grow. They usually lose money. So, the result is surplus forces through the profit motive, 
price is lower. Well, price is 14, still a lot of surplus. There is more price pressure down. So, again, the price goes down all the way, and I can just make a nice arrow here, all the way to the equilibrium. We we'll call it the market clearing price. So, it's simple basic, straightforward microeconomics that as long as businesses are greedy, as long as they want profit, as long as more profit is better and they try to maximize their profit, prices below the equilibrium will be driven up for more profit, but prices above equilibrium will be driven down. So, no matter where you start, as long as people maximize their profits, they will drive prices towards the equilibrium. And this applies equally well for money. Let's move on and see what I have. So, I explained the unsold surplus. That's page 19 for those of you who have textbooks. Okay, uh, the market is cleared, market is cleared, that's first paragraph of page 20, that referred, page 20, that's market clearing, okay. Next one, page 20, the profit motive, that's Again, uh, okay, I'll write it here, page 20, that's the profit motive, you can see it in the middle. And the next one, free adjustment of prices, the textbook calls it, how? The free, free price system, which is the same as free pricing. All you need to do is let prices be free. This applies for money. This applies for interest rates. This applies for houses. This applies for any commodity, including rights as the most important commodity. So the free price system, that's page 20. Jointly, only these two together, you need these two together to guarantee movement towards equilibrium. Shortage, that's page 21. Okay, you have it, you see it on the right? Page 21. The equilibrium price, again, I wrote an equilibrium, that's page, no, it's still 21. I have it on 21. The last paragraph is the equilibrium price. It's the intersection price I'm reading from the book. The price which tends to be the daily market price. Intersection meaning intersection between demand and supply, the price which clears the market. The price that clears the market is called the equilibrium price. The quantity is called the equilibrium quantity. Okay. Oh, the equilibrium price or the equilibrium quantity is uh, unique. Unique means there's only one price that clears the market, not two or three. Is it still visible? We've got occasion to zoom in, so you can see the picture. Yeah, and zoom. Do you know how to zoom in the bottom of the top? Yeah. All right. You see? So, the price that clears the market is unique. Only one price. You can't have two or three prices. Yeah, people may demand more, they may demand less. An example will be in the West, maybe even here. As the weather gets more hot, during the day, people demand. They just want to buy more ice cream. 
And as it gets cooler, and especially, let's say, in Europe, when it gets snow, people don't even buy ice cream anymore. So demand may change over the day. It may change with temperature. It may change with other things. But at one point in time, there is one unique demand point, OK? So one unique, my mistake, equilibrium point. Okay, and correspondingly one unique equilibrium supply. All right, so you will have shortages and surpluses driving towards the equilibrium. We call these things profit adjustment. We call these things in general. The general word is called market. forces, market forces, meaning not related to the government. Everybody acting in his own interest. You buy water if you want, and you buy iPhone if you want. You sell water if you like, and you sell iPhone if you like. You put your own price anywhere you want. All you need to do is to be self-interested. Consumers need to pay the lowest price, and sellers want to charge the highest price. That's all you need to do. Market forces. All right. Uh, the next, again, very simple concept that's on page 23 is rationing. Market, market rationing. For example, if water becomes a little bit scarce for some reason, doesn't work very well or whatever that might be, uh, maybe people want to buy water will be willing to pay double or triple. If there is a water shortage and the price of a bottle goes from 15 cents to two dollars, would you buy water? Short answer is only if you're very thirsty. And if you're not thirsty, you're not going to buy water. So rationing means that the market distributes goods only to those who are most willing to pay for it. You're really thirsty, then you're going to buy that water which is more expensive. Same thing happens with iPhones. You really want to get an iPhone, you're going to pay those seven or eight hundred or whatever, one thousand US uh, dollars. If not, you can buy a whole lot cheaper Galaxy for two or three hundred dollars. So, price is the function of rationing. If you're really hungry, you're going to buy rice with whatever else you want to buy and pay for it. And if not, you're not going to. Okay, that's called the rationing function of the market. Rationing is associated to scarce goods. It's associated with scarce goods. The main function of the market is to ration scarce goods to those most willing to pay for them. All right, so next one, again, basic economics. Suppose that there is an increase in demand, basic economics. So, demand curve shifts, demand curve shifts. This is the old equilibrium, quantity star, and price star, and this is the new one, price one star, and quantity one star. If demand increases, what happens is two things. The price one star goes up. So, <coughs> rising demand causes the price, the equilibrium price to rise, and 
causes the new equilibrium quantity to rise. That's very straightforward. We can add right next to it. Falling demand will cause the price to fall and the quantity to fall. Okay. Now, what about supply? Again, this is just simple, basic economics. Supply. Weather was nice, weather was good, there was sun, there was rain, everything was perfect, and you have a lot more rice. Okay, a lot more agricultural output. So supply shifts to the right. When supply shifts to the right, two things happen. So supply increases, causes number one, it causes the price to fall, price one star falls, and it causes supply, equilibrium supply to increase. So when supply increases, of course, the equilibrium supply increases and the price falls. That's basic economics. So this here is page 25. This is how the market adjusts. Basically, the adjustment when demand increases for whatever reason, could be more hot weather, people want to have more ice cream, the price tends to rise towards equilibrium and sellers tend to sell more ice cream. That's basic economics. Okay, let's see what else we have. Uh, here in the textbook, they draw the supply curve to be vertical or it could be like that. It is, the result is pretty much identical. That's on page 20. Okay. Well, here is the next thing. It's again common sense, but it's usually forgotten in economic analysis. You have two goods, X and Y. If you have two goods, X and Y, and consumers have a demand, demand. And here's the next key piece, supply of money is fixed. You got the same amount of money, you have the same $20 in your pocket, okay? And you got two goods, one may be water, the other one may be juice. Or, in the Western case, one may be coffee, the other one may be tea. This is very simple and very important to understand in terms of money and banking. You just have only two goods. It's very simple. When demand for X rises, it follows immediately that demand for Y. What happens to the demand for Y? It drops. That's very easy and people somehow forget it all the time. Demand for one good, given the same supply of money, must always mean, for sure, guarantee that the demand for the other good must necessarily drop. Well, if demand for Y drops, does it mean that demand for X will rise when we have only two goods? Yes, absolutely. Guaranteed. So, rising demand for the one means falling demand for the other. And the opposite is also true. Falling demand for one means rising demand for the other and opposite. This is extremely important observation. This is one of the most important observations related to inflation. All right, we finish, you take 10 minutes, okay, begin.